I'm going to show you how to shoot more professional looking video with your smartphone. There are quirks about smartphones that often trip up filmmakers used to working with cameras that have manual control. But if you learn to work around them, you can shoot beautiful, professional looking cinematic video with your smartphone. In fact, you can go from being a beginner to a filmmaker in one simple step. Here's how. A big beginner will often take their smartphone out, open the camera app, and then maybe feel a little bit lost. And this is why beginners often shoot video with what I call a roving camera. They might be on a trip somewhere and want to capture some memories of the location, but they're not thinking like a filmmaker, so they just try to film everything in one shot, either by roving around or shooting everything with a wide angle. However, if you watch a movie or a TV show and look closely at the shots used, you'll find the camera is quite still most of the time. As well, more close-ups are used than wide shots. Essentially, the complete opposite of what a beginner does. The biggest difference between a beginner and a professional is that a professional will be shooting video with their edit in mind. So the first thing you actually need to do to become a filmmaker before you start thinking about settings like shutter speed or frame rate is to start thinking about how your shots are going to edit together. This is the difference it makes when you film with the edit in mind. Well, I'm using my smartphone here with everything still in auto. But when I'm filming, I'm looking for striking images. Each shot hopefully has its own little story, which will fit with others to tell a bigger story. Most smartphone cameras are designed with the average consumer in mind, not really filmmakers. For that reason, they tend towards overexposing the frame. And an overexposed frame often means ugly, washed out white areas where information is going to be forever lost. If there are overexposed areas in the frame, we can easily improve our videos or photos simply by pulling down the exposure. And this is easy to do on most smartphones, iPhone or Android. Just touch the screen and slide your finger to set the exposure darker or brighter. Hold down to lock that new setting while you shoot the video. Now when you stop recording the video, your exposure setting will be reset. And that can be a bit annoying if we intend to shoot several takes. So one way to get around this reset is to pause recording instead of stopping. Now this means you'll get a bunch of shots all in one clip, but at least you don't have to keep resetting your exposure for every shot. Unfortunately, the iPhone's native camera doesn't come with a pause record option. Okay, now you can take the next step and think about how you're going to frame your shots. When you're making a video, everything that you put in the frame says something. Framing a shot is mostly about balance. You may have seen the cliche of the film director holding his hands together to create a frame. Directors and DOPs do this when they're looking for a way to balance the elements within the frame to tell a story. There's literally infinite ways we can use framing. Unfortunately, this also makes it harder to work out how to frame a shot. Let's make things easier. There are a few guidelines that we can follow to help us narrow things down a bit. So most smartphones have a setting that allows you to turn on the rule of thirds grid in your camera app. The rule of thirds is really just a simplification of the golden ratio. Artists and mathematicians saw the golden ratio in nature and applied it to their work. It seems our minds are hardwired to subconsciously recognize this ratio. Images that conform to it are said to look more beautiful than those that don't. Actually, it's quite simple to use. Just place objects of interest at the intersections of the grid lines. Put your horizon on the top or bottom horizontal line. Put people or vertical objects on the left or right vertical line. Frame your shot so their eyes are on or close to the top horizontal line. If you put objects in the center of the frame, they dominate it. Centered objects force us to look at them rather than contemplate the whole scene. Like when you're shooting a portrait. Objects at the side of the frame invite us to look past them. They're less dominant than a centrally placed object, and therefore they seem to the audience less important. 
Using the grid just helps you prioritize which objects in the frame you want to be the most important. And of course, it helps you to make more beautiful images and hold the viewer's attention longer. Balance is related to the symmetry of the contents within the frame. And this might be as simple as placing two subjects, one each side of the frame, symmetrically. So this is symmetrical and this isn't. And the first one is more likely to make you feel comfortable and relaxed while the second is more likely to make you feel like something is kind of off. And when I think of symmetry in filmmaking, two famous filmmakers come to mind, Stanley Kubrick and Wes Anderson, because both these filmmakers use many shots where the contents of the frame are based around some kind of balanced symmetry. Framing a shot with perfect symmetry can evoke a sense of order and power. That's why gardens of the wealthy were, and still are, often arranged to look perfectly symmetrical. Apart from being pleasing to the eye, gardens are arranged this way to let the visitors know how wealthy and powerful the owners are. So the third element to think about when you're framing a shot is depth. The depth of an image is about foreground, midground, and background. Placing objects in the foreground makes the frame look more three-dimensional, for example. A sense of depth in a frame is also created by the depth of field of the lens used. Basically just refers to how much is in focus at the same time. A lens with a wide depth of field creates a frame where most objects are in focus. Or if something is out of focus, then it's only slightly blurry. On the other hand, a lens with a shallow depth of field creates a frame where only a small part of the frame is in focus. So for example, only the subject is in focus while the background and foreground are completely out of focus. So smartphones usually come with lenses which have a wide depth of field, which means creating a sense of depth through focus is a bit more of a challenge. My new book, Smartphone Videography, Beginners to Advanced, is now available for my members on Patreon. It's over 170 pages long, and it will help you to go from a complete novice to more advanced. It's full of tips and knowledge to help you get the best looking video from your smartphone. So now there's another thing that professional filmmakers do that beginners often don't, and that is to record multiple takes. A beginner will usually get one shot of something they find interesting and then move on. But professionals usually get at least two takes of every shot. So there's a couple of reasons you want more than one take. Well, one reason is for safety, because digital video can be deleted by accident or become corrupted for some reason. And if you only have one take of an important shot and then you go and lose it, it's not fun. But the main reason for shooting take after take of the same shot is to perfect it. Depending on the complexity of the shot, it can take time to get everything to click as you hoped. There might be an issue with sound, like a plane flying overhead. So maybe the performance of the talent or the camera movement isn't as good as it could be. Having multiple takes gives you more to work with when editing. On the other hand, too many takes can be a bit overwhelming, but it all depends on the project and the time you have to invest in extra takes and extra time hunting through those takes later. Okay, let's look at how to expose a frame using a smartphone. So should we always lock exposure? Well, it's often best to, but I recommend that you don't rule out using auto exposure. Because in fact, right now, I have my Samsung Note 20 Ultra in pro mode. It's setting the exposure and the focus automatically. So before I talk about exposure, it's good to understand the terminology related to setting exposure. For example, what do we mean by underexposure and overexposure? A frame is overexposed when there is too much light hitting the sensor. This will lead to some or all of the image going completely white. When filming with a smartphone, any area of the image that is completely white usually has zero image information. So this means that the information that could have been captured by the sensor if it was correctly exposed, it's just not there. So no grading magic later on is gonna save you and bring back those details. But here's another exposure related term. When we talk about white areas, we often refer to them as blown out highlights. So the opposite problem to overexposure is, you guessed it, underexposure. 
So a frame is underexposed when there is not enough light hitting the sensor. And this will lead to some or all of the image going completely black. However, when filming with a smartphone, any area of the image that is completely black doesn't necessarily mean the information is lost, like it is with the white areas. Because in my experience, areas that appear black when filming do actually retain some amount of information that can be recovered when grading the image later. So for that reason, I generally lean towards underexposing a smartphone shot video if it means I can save some areas from getting blown out. Depending on the light and the dynamic range of the sensor, a frame can be both under and overexposed at the same time. For example, if you have very bright highlights and dark shadows, you can have both blown out highlights and totally underexposed dark shadows. And this is going to result in a frame with very high contrast. But when we talk about something having high contrast, it means there's lots of dark areas and also lots of bright areas but there's less subtle shades or tones in between. So therefore the images with high contrast appear to contain less finer details, which gives them the look of a lower resolution image. And this kind of demonstrates that simply hitting the 4K button on your camera app doesn't necessarily lead to high quality looking video. It's not just the sensor or the grading software causing a highly contrasting image. It actually starts with the light conditions when capturing the shot. So as beginners, we generally understand that it's possible for there to be too little light for filming purposes. But we may not realize that there can also be too much light. Whether we set our camera to shoot 4K or 1080p, the dynamic range of our camera sensor is going to have a big effect on how well it performs in different light conditions. The sensor's dynamic range dictates how well it can deal with different levels of light in the same frame. You'll notice this in bright daylight, where the bright areas are much brighter than the shadowy areas of the image. High contrast. Although they're getting better, smartphone camera sensors generally have less dynamic range than devices with bigger sensors, like mirrorless or DSLR cameras. In most smartphones, the main sensor has the best dynamic range, and is therefore most able to cope with low and high levels of light. So this is something to think about if you're filming yourself with a front-facing selfie camera. It's not your best camera. For that reason, when I'm filming myself, I will always try to use the main camera. So whatever camera you use, to get more professional looking video, you need to understand when and how to control exposure. Most smartphones give you the option to lock exposure in the native camera app. So just to be clear, when I talk about the native camera app, I'm talking about the app that comes with your phone, as opposed to a third party app like Filmic Pro, for example. So with both at Samsung phones and iPhones, touch the screen and a circle or square appears. Wherever you place this circle or square, the exposure and focus will be set on what you tap on. And I think most other camera apps will work the same way too. Yeah, so in this frame, if I tap on the sky, the camera will set focus and exposure on the sky. But what does that do to the rest of the image? Below the skyline, everything goes very dark. On the other hand, when I tap below the skyline, the landscape is now much better exposed, but the sky starts to blow out. And then we lose the information in those white areas. So you can see that setting exposure is a kind of balancing act. So our job as videographer is to decide on the best balance. However, when we leave our camera in auto, we're leaving it to make those decisions for us. When we set exposure, we need to decide what's the most important for the frame we're composing. If you want the audience to enjoy a beautiful sky, then set exposure on the sky. If the landscape is more important, then expose for that. But if we're exposing for the sky, I would suggest we make that the dominant element in the frame. We could then put the skyline on the bottom line of the rule of thirds grid and leave the landscape in silhouette. On the other hand, if we expose for the landscape, then it makes sense to place the skyline on the top line of the grid. So this is a simple example of how we use framing and exposure together. The framing choices we make inform exposure choices as well as other choices. When we're filming a person, exposure becomes a bit more tricky. That's because exposing a face correctly is so important. If the lighting is too bright or too harsh, it can look unflattering. Alternatively, if the light is too dark, the audience will feel uncomfortable 
if they can't see the subject's face clearly. As well, having a darkly lit face can imply the person is sinister in some way. In movies, when we want to imply a person has dark thoughts, we often use a darkly lit or silhouetted face. So unless you're using dark lighting for dramatic purposes, you'll want a nice, even light on the subject's face. If you have a background which is too bright, when you set exposure correctly on the face, the background can blow out. On the other hand, your whole frame will look nicer if you have a less bright background. So this can be as simple as turning to face in the opposite direction. So far we've looked at setting exposure when our camera is fixed at one angle. But when shooting professional looking video, we don't want to be limited to a fixed angle. Especially when shooting with a smartphone as they're so easy to move around. The thing is that exposing a shot when we're moving the camera is a little bit more complicated. If the camera moves from a light area to a dark area, or vice versa, then the exposure is going to adjust during the shot. And this often looks a bit messy and unprofessional. In this shot inside, when I pan the camera to the window, we can see the exposure adjust because the windows are obviously much brighter than other parts of the room. To fix this, we need to think about locking exposure. To lock exposure using an iPhone or a Samsung, and I'm guessing other Android phones too, just tap on the screen and hold. On the iPhone, the square reticle makes a kind of flashing motion. You also get a message at the top of the screen, AEAF lock. So that means auto exposure and auto focus are now locked. So in theory, when we move the camera, the locked exposure and focus will not adjust during the shot. So if we pan round to a window, the camera doesn't adjust to expose the window correctly. And this locked exposure shot looks less messy, but the downside is that the windows are kind of blown out. Having blown out windows, it's not the end of the world, and you will even see this in professionally short movies. However, we can improve this situation by adjusting what's known as the exposure compensation value. Tap the screen to bring up the exposure and focus reticle, and you will see a sun icon. So this is a slider which can be moved to adjust this thing called exposure compensation. Exposure compensation is an adjustment to the automatic exposure set by your camera. So normally your camera will look at the frame and then decide on an exposure level. But if you think your camera is overexposing the frame, you can just adjust it down and vice versa for an underexposed image. So if we drag this symbol up and down or sideways, depending on your device, you will see this screen get lighter and darker. The camera is still setting exposure, but adjusting that exposure depending on where you move this slider. In this shot where I pan to the window, I'm going to lock exposure and then adjust the exposure compensation down a little bit. Now when I pan to the window, it's not so blown out. Neither version of this shot is right or wrong. This is a creative choice where we as videographers balance one element against another. We might decide we can sacrifice a bit of brightness inside to make the windows less blown out. So the next step in mastering your smartphone camera is to think about using manual control. If you have an iPhone, you can use a third-party app like Filmic Pro. If you have an Android like a Samsung, you can use Video Pro Mode. But there's also a downside to using manual controls. So let's just quickly go over the pros and cons. In a smartphone camera, there are basically two settings which control exposure shutter speed and ISO. If our shutter speed is too high, the video becomes less smooth. That's because fast shutter speed reduces the amount of motion blur in the frame. Motion blur helps to smooth out camera movement or things moving in the frame. So simply put, fast shutter speed reduces exposure but results in less smooth video. Slow shutter speed increases exposure and adds motion blur. If our ISO is too high, there is more digital noise in the image. You'll notice this in the shadows or in nighttime shots. On the whole, digital noise is seen as something we don't want, which degrades the quality of our video. So again, simply put, high ISO increases exposure, but also increases digital noise. Low ISO decreases exposure, but also decreases digital noise. So once again, you can see that our job as smartphone videographers is to balance the pros and cons of each setting. How much motion blur do we require as a minimum? How much digital noise is too much? 
There's no rule here, it's simply down to our own judgement. And once more, it's all down to the dynamic range of our camera sensor. When there's too much light, we worry about blown out areas of the image or shutter speed that's too fast, and the video looks unnaturally sharp and juddering when we pan. On the other hand, when there's not enough light, our shutter speed is slow and our pan shots are nice and smooth. But now, we worry about the digital noise, created by having to push up the ISO. Okay, we've talked a lot about framing and we've talked a lot about exposure, but let's talk about another really important element when shooting smartphone video, and that element is focus. Using our native camera app, we can set focus and lock focus. Again, we will be using the yellow square or the white circle, depending on the device, which controls focus as well as exposure. To set focus in our smartphone's native camera, tap on the screen on the subject you want to be in focus. Your smartphone should work out how far away the subject is and adjust focus to that distance. Just be aware setting focus by tapping a screen this way is not 100% reliable. It might take a few taps to find the right spot, with a small screen, it's also easy to believe your subject is in focus, and then later you find you've focused on the background. With the exposure and focus combined, what do we do if we want to set the exposure differently to the focus? I might tap on my subject to get focus, and then find the background is overexposed. In that case, lock exposure and focus on the subject, and then use the exposure compensation slider to adjust the exposure down. Now the background is exposed better and the subject is still in focus. So that's how to set and lock focus. But can we also use autofocus when we're getting a shot? If we shoot using unlocked autofocus, it means the focus will constantly adjust and readjust during a shot. But is this a bad thing? Well, in some cases, yes. And actually, it depends a lot on your device and how nicely it changes focus. Expensive flagship devices like my Samsung Note 20 Ultra, the latest iPhones like the iPhone 12 Pro Max, the Samsung S21 Ultra, they all change focus pretty smoothly. On the other hand, lower budget devices like this Xiaomi 11T struggle to find focus sometimes, and when they do, they don't adjust focus smoothly. Professionals quite frequently move focus during a shot, you know, in movies and TV shows. It's known as a rack focus or a focus pull. The difference is there's usually a crew member employed with the specific skill of focus pulling, making sure it's done professionally. Anyway, that said, I found these automatic focus pulls are actually usable uh, if you have the right device. So I recommend playing around with this to see if it's usable for your projects. Just start filming and then move the camera a little and let the autofocus move from foreground object to background or vice versa. So another use for autofocus is when we're filming ourselves solo. So when I'm filming myself talking to camera like now, I use my Samsung Note 20 Ultra in pro video mode, but with everything in auto. So I found that the Note 20 Ultra has really good face detection autofocus. So as soon as it recognizes a face, it locks on and sets focus. So the only issue I've found is that if there are faces in the background, it can sometimes focus on them instead. So with this setup, it means that I can start recording and then run around in position and I don't have to worry about getting focus right. And it also means that I can move around in frame and hopefully the camera will keep me in focus. So another way to control focus in your smartphone is to set it manually. So if you have an Android with some kind of pro video mode, you'll be able to set focus manually there. If you have an iPhone, you'll need a third party app like Filmic Pro. For example, in Filmic Pro, swipe up and down on a control slider to set focus. In Samsung's Video Pro mode, again, just swipe up and down to set focus. Filmic Pro and other apps have extra focus features. For example, Filmic Pro allows you to automate a focus pull. You can also switch on focus peaking, which helps you set focus correctly. In Samsung's Pro Video mode, focus peaking appears as soon as you start setting focus manually. So, using manual focus is great if your subject is not moving during the shot, but if you want the focal distance to change, then you're going to need to perform a focus pull manually or use autofocus 
So again, it's all about weighing up the pros and cons of each method and deciding what's going to work best in each situation. Whether your shots are shaky or smooth, it's good to know some basic shot types. Filmmaking uses all kinds of shots and angles as ingredients to be mixed together when editing. And these types of shots sometimes need different equipment to achieve. A wide angle lens for a wide shot or a smartphone gimbal for a tracking shot, for example. There are three core shot types around which all shots are based or rooted, and they are wide angle, medium, and close up. A wide angle shot is pretty self-explanatory. It gives you a wide view of the scene. It makes sense that we would often use a wide angle lens for a wide angle shot, but it's not always the case. Using a wide angle lens simply means you don't have to be as distant from the scene to get a wide view which makes it easier to get the shot. But actually, you can use a telephoto to shoot a wide angle. Then you'd have to stand further away to get the shot. Wide angle shots are used for all kinds of reasons, but one common use of a wide angle shot is as an establishing shot. An establishing shot sets the scene to give your audience an idea of where the scene is taking place. A medium shot brings us closer to the subject, but still wide enough to show other elements in the scene. It allows us to feel closer to the subject, but without the intensity of a close-up. Vloggers often use a medium or a kind of medium close-up, and they avoid a kind of true close-up because it's too intense for a vlog. And so a vlog is usually quite informal and too much intimacy would be off-putting. And the same goes for hosts presenting a TV show. The director of the show will usually keep the camera no closer than a medium close-up, unless something emotional is happening. If a guest is in tears, for example, a TV director will often tell his camera crew to zoom in. Remember, humans are used to being a certain distance from each other, and your camera is now your audience's eyes. When we meet new people, we keep a respectful distance. We need to be close enough to communicate and read each other's expressions, but not too close that we invade their body space. So like I say, a close-up is generally reserved for more intense, intimate framing. Well, if we're filming a human subject, that is. Otherwise, a close-up is useful for showing important information that might be missed with a wider shot. I use close-ups for tech reviews because I want to show the piece of kit in more detail. But in a fiction movie, I would use a close-up to show an action of a character that's important to the plot. Or maybe a character secretly glances at his phone while he's focusing on something else. Another reason to use a close-up is to minimize distractions. Put simply, if you want to make sure the audience's attention is focused on one thing only, shoot a close-up. Shooting close-ups with smartphones can be a little bit more difficult than with other cameras. And that's because pretty much all smartphones' main cameras use a wide-angle lens. To shoot a close-up with a wide-angle lens, you're going to have to get really close, which can be a bit off-putting for the subject or just not practical. And if your smartphone has a telephoto lens and it's not too dark, then you can use that. But that brings us to another aspect of your smartphone camera, and that is the lenses. But pretty much every smartphone currently on the market comes with at least two cameras, a rear-facing camera and a front-facing camera. The big advantage of the front-facing camera is that you can see yourself, so it's easier to get the lighting, framing and focus right if you're filming on your own. The disadvantage is that this camera usually produces video quite a bit lower in quality than the main rear camera. More recently, there are phones which have high quality selfie cameras, such as the Samsung S21 Ultra, which has a 40 megapixel selfie camera. Apart from the selfie camera, these days there's usually one or two extra rear facing cameras. So most expensive flagship devices come with a telephoto and an ultra wide option. Even lower budget phones now come with at least one extra rear camera, which is usually an ultra-wide camera. The cameras we can expect to find in smartphones are wide-angle, ultra-wide-angle, telephoto and macro. So when should we use each one? On smartphones, the main camera is nearly always a wide-angle lens. With a regular camera, a commonly used stock lens usually has a narrower field of view. So that's one major characteristic that makes smartphones different from a DSLR or mirrorless camera. A wide-angle lens is useful for showing a lot of the view in front of the camera. But it's also useful for vlogging, as you don't have to stand so far from the camera. With a telephoto lens, you need to be quite a distance from the camera to frame a nice medium close-up shot. 
A wide angle lens is also better than a telephoto when it comes to handheld filming because a tele lens will exaggerate your handshake more. In smartphones, this lens is usually combined with the best quality camera, best in low light and shallower depth of field. So that's another reason to use it. An ultra wide lens is even better for getting more of the view in frame, but it also usually creates distinctive distortions to the image and so any straight lines will come out curved. An ultra-wide is also even better for masking those bumps and handshakes. On the downside, the ultra-wide camera of our smartphones usually doesn't have as good a performance in low-light situations, and you might find you get lots of extra digital noise. A telephoto lens not only gets you closer to the subject, but it also narrows the field of view. The telephoto and wide lenses actually have different characteristics, so it's not like just zooming in on a photo, for example. If we frame a subject identically with a wide angle and a telephoto, the image will still look different. What you'll notice is that the background is narrower and it also changes the shape of the subject's face. But a telephoto is great for getting a close-up shot without having to get nearer to the subject. The downside is that, like with the ultra-wide camera, telephoto cameras in smartphones perform a little bit more poorly in low-light conditions. Macro lenses are used solely for getting extremely close microscopic close-ups, mostly demonstrated by filming insects crawling on flower petals. Now, I would say they're used more in photography than video work, but if you need to show some tiny details, use a macro. Macro lenses only have a very short focal length, so anything beyond a few centimeters is going to be out of focus. And some smartphones have a separate button to switch the macro lens, while others switch automatically once you're close enough. In the past, we only had one option when it came to video frame rate on our smartphones, and that was 30 frames per second of video, or 30 FPS. These days, smartphones usually give us more than one frame rate option. For example, my iPhone 12 Pro Max offers me 24 frames per second, 30 frames per second, and 60 frames per second. In camera settings, I can also toggle on PAL, or PAL, which is a European TV frame rate standard. And this actually just adds a 25 frames per second option. So when we are thinking about choosing our frame rate, there's two things to consider. The frame rate that we record at, and the frame rate that we play back at. If we get this wrong, we can end up with jerky, juddering video when editing, and in the final video as well. So established about 100 years ago, 24 frames per second is the standard for movies that are shown in theatres. And this frame rate came from a compromise between a smooth looking motion and the practicality of moving 35mm film stock through a camera or a projector without breaking it, not to mention the cost of buying, processing and delivering rolls of film. So therefore, when we shoot 24 frames per second, our video will look a little bit more like film, especially if we also manage to keep the shutter speed to something similar to the speed film cameras use. 30 frames per second is the standard TV frame rate in America and other countries. When shooting and playing back video at 30 frames per second, it does look a little bit more digital than 24 frames per second. When we view video at a higher playback rate, it looks smoother. You can also use 30 frames per second to create a subtle slow motion effect. If you record at 30 frames per second and then play it back at 24 frames per second, for example. So just simply place it on your editing timeline and reduce the speed to 80%. If you record and play back video at 60 frames per second, it looks twice as smooth as 30 frames per second video. To my eyes, video produced this way is reminiscent of a video game. Lovers of the old fashioned film look just don't usually like the digital smoothness at all, whereas others who see 24 frames per second as something stuck in the past prefer the extra smoothness and clarity. That said, the 60 frames per second playback lovers are still very much in the minority. One big reason for not playing back video at 60 frames per second is that it also creates files twice the size as 30 frames per second video. So, in a sense, we're making that same compromise filmmakers made 100 years ago. In fact, 60 frames per second is used mostly for creating a slow motion effect. So play it back at 30 frames per second, which is 50%, or 24 frames per second, which is 40%, for that true cinematic slow-mo look. 
Now, smartphones can also shoot higher frame rates, like 120 frames per second or 240 frames per second. And some can shoot absurdly high frame rates, although they use a digital process to achieve this. But the problem with these very high frame rates is they're often limited to a reduced resolution. You'll be stuck on 1080p or 720p uh, resolution. Yeah, so that's it for this video. Uh, massive thanks to all the new members who uh, joined on Patreon in the last few weeks. It's your support that actually helped me to write this book. It's 170 pages. It's like basically this video, but a lot more. There's all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so that's it. And uh, ciao, I'll see you in the next video.